Welcome to the What's Your Grief podcast. I'm Eleanor Haley. And I'm Lisa Williams. We're the mental health professionals turned grief friends turned co-founders of the website What's Your Grief. In this podcast, we talk candidly about all things grief, from pop culture to grief theory. No tilted heads, no soothing tones, just us and our grief friends exploring the always devastating, often confusing, and sometimes even funny experience of living life after loss. Hey, welcome to the What's Your Grief podcast. This is Eleanor, and I'm joined by Lisa, who I believe is now back stateside. Welcome home, Lisa. Thank you. It has been like a lovely morning being back in Baltimore. Yeah, and the sun is actually out for you. It's been so rainy. I don't know where people are listening from, but where we are, oh my gosh, it is been raining every single day. It feels like for weeks and weeks on end. So it's nice to yeah. see the sun. I kept seeing that. It's so funny. I was actually just thinking about it because I was thinking about how with social media, mm-hmm. we have this like ability to be tuned into the weather when you're traveling in a way that's like not normally true. Like I was seeing, it was clearly rainy enough that I was seeing people in Baltimore posting about the weather or complaining about the weather or just like, and I was like, oh, all right, well, clearly that's what's going on with the weather in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was pleasantly surprised to wake up today. Beautiful day. I am jet lagged. So I woke up incredibly early and I am not a morning person at all. So it's very strange for me to be up really early, but I like took advantage of it. Yeah. And I got up and took a shower and took a long walk and had a cup of coffee and sort of did those things that allowed me to appreciate for a few minutes why mm-hmm. people like being a morning person. <laughs> I was like, look at me up and out before lots of other people or when I would normally still be asleep. But I will, I'm sure, quickly go back to my old ways of staying up too late and sleeping uh-huh. too late. So that, that's my update. How about you? Oh, gosh. Well, I'm still not a morning person, but <laughs> I was up early the other day and I, I'm with you. I was on the street like because where we live, there's always a ton of traffic and we live in Baltimore. So as many people across the country probably heard, or even beyond a major bridge in our area, just kind of, it was hit by a big, big ship and it crumbled essentially. Uh, and that has changed the traffic patterns in such a way mm-hmm. that it is now just a nightmare to go anywhere at certain times of day. So I was up early on the roads and I was like, oh my gosh. It's so, this is so luxurious. It's like, you have you ever seen that Seinfeld when Elaine and um like her Kramer like widen the lanes yes. on the highways and she's like dodge weaving her car and like, this is so luxurious. That's how I felt. Uh, and I was like, oh gosh, I should get up earlier. And I knew just deep down in my heart of hearts, it wasn't going to actually happen. But I do I see, I do see the benefits, but my, my, I just like, I know I could probably get there even though I've tried so many times and I haven't gotten Mm -mm. there. I know I could probably get there, but right now my body just resists it. Like even when I'm up early and I'm like, this is nice. I'm like, my body's like, no, go lay back down. You need to be horizontal. (laughs) So Yeah. And I mean, I do think like, obviously when people work for a very long time, a certain way and have to change, but I I am a big believer that like chronotypes are a thing. Like there Mm -hmm. is part of it that's very clear that some people are wired to be late night people and summer early morning people and from a survival perspective that was helpful for us as a species to not all be on the Mm -hmm. same sleep cycle for protection but I I think it's hard to change it unless you really really I mean if you have to for work there have certainly been periods in time in my life poof yeah I have very unpleasant memories of of having to be at work at 7 a.m and it was just not good for my Not good for my chronotype. Um, (laughs) But, well, I was thinking about you yesterday since now we, Mm -hmm. the day we are recording is the day after Mother's Day. And I had sort of an unexpectedly complicated Mother's Day, but I was, yeah, wondering how, how your Mother's Day was. I, it was pretty good. We're, where we are right now in life is just so busy that 
I feel like it was kind of just another busy day, but the family did take some time out to like be sweet and do nice things for me. Like nothing big, but like small things that I actually really do appreciate. Like my husband helped me clean a lot more than usual, which was really nice because it made my life a lot easier. And the girls all kind of in their own little way did little things. Agnes like made me a card that was like really sweet and which she's four when she gave it to me like I, I was already like something else had already kind of caught me it, mm -hmm. early in the day I was getting a little teary like small things were kind of getting to me and so I was tearing up a little bit and I was you know I don't know it's hard to explain um to a four-year-old because they just associate tears with sadness you know so it's kind of hard to explain that that it doesn't mean that you're sad in a bad way and, you know, because you don't want them to think like, oh, gosh, I don't want to do that again because I don't want mom to cry or whatever. So it's it's complicated, you know, but we always try to navigate those waters as best as we can. But anyways, yeah, it was it was a it was a good day overall. Nothing, nothing major, nothing special. And I definitely did have those moments that kind of got to me. And I'm very far out now from my mom's death. I've had many Mother's Days since she died. So for all those people who are in the space where it's really fresh, my heart just goes out to you because I know that like those small moments that I had um, are probably for many people magnified times 50. Yeah, we had a we had an interesting comment. Somebody left on Instagram just saying that they were, it was uh, 18 years. I can't remember now. Um, I should have looked it up. 18 years since the death of their child or the death of their mom. I can't remember. It was one or the other. And talking about how, for whatever reason, it had just bubbled up so mm -hmm. much this year. And yeah. that like it had been a while since they had had such a hard Mother's Day. And I was I was just thinking about how yeah. we had just a few episodes sort of talked about that, about just like the cycles of it and how it's so hard to predict. And you just never know when, you know, you have a, a string of years where it feels like, okay, wow, uh, you know, I'm, I'm managing. And then all of a sudden yeah. you have a year where it just like, it, it feels like it explosively bubbles up again. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, like something that I, I'm noticing is that it's it's about my relationship with my mom, but also my relationship with motherhood and how I feel about motherhood. And and for other people, like it'll look very different. Like I have my my three girls, but other people may have never had children and are now wondering if they wish they had, or maybe they always wanted to, but they struggled with infertility and things like that. And so your relationship with motherhood and your feelings around that and your experiences around that are always kind of changing, I think, if that's something you're really connected to, which which I do feel very connected to. And so for me, I can see it. It kind of relates to something I sort of wanted to bring up today is that I ha like I said, I have a four-year-old, but I also have much older daughters as well. I have a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old, and they're at this age where they're kind of moving on and doing new things often. So like chapters are ending and new chapters are starting, but with the close of every chapter, there's a lot of feelings there. I was sat at, I went to, I went or watched three separate games lacrosse game so we are like we're in maryland so we're just like very that prototypical i have two people in my family who are very into lacrosse i never played sports as a kid but my husband coaches two teams my daughter is very um into it and so we there there have been several different situations where i've been at season ending games where there are seniors who are done and they're moving on and my daughter's mm -hmm. kind of graduating from one stage of it and moving on to another and so she just ended and there's so much emotion tied to that like so many tears from these kids as they not only maybe are sad that they might be lost a game that felt important but also that they're just moving on from something and then along with that graduations and things like that. My daughter's kind of graduating from the school she's been in for 14 years. And so it just reminded me of all these, like, it feels like a lowercase L type of loss, right? It's something that you might not even label as loss. It's something that you might not ever even label your emotions as grief, but there's still something that is feels significant that can bring up a lot of feelings and emotions and kind of change how we feel about life and our relationships and, and, and a role like motherhood or some other type of role. And so I wanted to just take a minute to acknowledge that because with it being spring, 
I think a lot of people are probably navigating these things where they're excited about an another chapter, but closing the door on, on another. And so there's a lot of this probably coming up for people. And just a reminder that if you're feeling that, hey, wait, I actually am feeling a lot more kind of complicated, sad type of feelings, maybe even fear, things like that, that that's normal. And it's okay to really label that and maybe take some space to find coping for that or support for that if that's something that you're struggling with. Yeah, I think it's so true. And I think oftentimes this time of year, you see a lot in the grief space about thinking about when people aren't present for graduations, you know, a, a parent or a sibling yeah. or, you know, if someone has died and being able to create space for that bittersweet difficulty of acknowledging that it's this really happy event and that's going to be a reminder that someone is missing. But I think sometimes what gets lost in that conversation is exactly what you're mentioning, which is there's a whole other layer too, which is mm -hmm. even if you put death loss aside, there are these other losses that go with it, like these stage of life losses that are complicated. And I think for kids, I mean, I remember at certain times in my life of having that, like those feelings that were supposed to be happy. I mean, specifically going back to my college graduation, but that's probably because I don't know, maybe that I, it, mm -hmm. I remember that because it's closer to me than other ones. Um, but of really re like being not just sad that my dad wasn't there, but being so having so many complicated feelings about graduation in general and sort of ending this stage of my life and going on to another one. And I don't know, there's I, I certainly remember my family creating space for acknowledging that my dad wasn't there and how hard that was for all of us. But I don't I don't really remember as much of a space for it was, you know, I, I think I did feel yeah. like, oh, this is just supposed to be ha exciting. Like you're graduating from college. I don't remember a lot of space being created yeah. for just the sadness of moving on from that stage of life. And this is something I think that we, w one of the things that came from COVID that was sort of a, a positive is that we did create space to label things like this as loss for people because kids had a lot of things taken from them during that time, as did everybody. But I think that that's one thing that we did a good job of then. But as we move further and further beyond it, I, I'm not sure where we always are. And so, yeah, I absolutely. I just think like that's a good point because here on this podcast, we are always thinking about the grief caused by those death losses or absence type of losses. And we're not always saying yes. And also there's all this other stuff that goes along with it. A lot of, you know, yeah. excitement for the next chapter, but also like a lot of sadness, so many relationships, just realistically, you know, they are not going to stay the same as you move forward. There's a lot of fear about the unknown. My older daughter, when she moved on to high school, she would kill me for saying this, but there's absolutely no chance anyone she knows is listening to this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> before she headed into high school, like she slept on our floor for like, weeks leading up to that. And I, she would never admit it, but I think it's because she was just like scared and nervous, you know? And so yeah. I do think that there's a lot of stuff that isn't just excitement. And is if we um, only label the excitement stuff and the looking forward stuff, I think sometimes we miss an opportunity to really learn from or to validate some of those other experiences. So I thought it was yeah. worth saying. No, I think it is. I think it is worth saying. And I think it is something just that it, from so many different directions should be should be acknowledged. So I'm glad mm -hmm. you mentioned it. Yeah. Though not though though not related to what we are actually going to talk about uh, for today, so we'll have to do wow. a hard pivot. Um, you know, we've had some requests lately, I guess, for talking a bit about pet loss, and. I feel a lot of uh, guilt about this topic because I have been working on an article about pet loss for probably literally a year, maybe more, that I have not managed <laughs> to get to get published on the What's Your Grief site. I have not managed to get it finished. I think because when I started writing it connected to my own experience with my dog's death. And so I was like, I, I had my own acute grief things going on, but also just because it has, it became so big, like it started moving in all of these different directions. I think now I've 
it, it probably should be maybe a series of a couple of articles. But I felt a lot of guilt with that people were like, I wish you all had more on pet loss. Do you have anything else? I see you have two articles, but do you have anything else? Um, so I'm glad we're going to talk about this today because I've been feeling I'm, I am still going to get that article done, but I'm glad yeah. we're making space for it here on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think that this is a big loss that a lot of people experience at some point in their lives. So much so that I almost feel like that's part of why it gets minimized. Like it kind of, I think, is seen as sort of a rite of passage sometimes for kids to have that experience. Like it's often their first experience with death. And so I do feel like for that reason, it often gets sort of minimized, like, oh, yeah, that happens, you know. Uh, but what we know, obviously, is that when we have a long you know, term relationship with a pet or even one that maybe didn't last that long, we become oftentimes just very bonded and very connected with that animal in so many, 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 many ways that of course their death is going to rock your world. Uh, but because our society doesn't always kind of validate that as being a significant loss, we don't always get the support that we need. We don't always ourselves feel like we should take the time that we need to grieve it. And so we definitely wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about like why this is such a difficult loss and some of the, you know, unique factors that come along with experiencing the death of a pet. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's so many reasons and I, I guess part of this, it, it reminds me of the reason that this the article got so big um, for me trying to write it. I think one of the things that is hard is that like there is that disenfranchised part you talked about about it gets minimized. You know, there's not a, there's not a lot that is always available there there I say that but there's so much more now. I mean, if you look online mm -hmm. for like pet loss support, there's a, there's a lot that you can find. But I I do think that still within people's immediate, you know, so kind of social circle or work or things like that, there are a lot of things that people still feel self-conscious about. And I mean, this is maybe really personal to my experience, but the one article that I have written uh, on What's Your Grief Already was an article that I think I just titled My Dog is Dying. And the reason that I wrote about it is because when I went online and I was sort of in this really anticipatory place where my dog was sick and my dog was dying for, for a while, like my dog was sick and dying for a while, I could find so little about anticipatory mm. pet loss. And I realized that I was feeling far more self-conscious about like talking about the experience of my dog dog being sick and dying than I had about deaths of animals in the past. Like mm. there is something about, you know, if you're, if your family member it has cancer and you're going through that process of like caregiving and the illness and all of that, I think it's, you know, it, it's a little bit normalized to be able to talk about that and sort of seek support around it and have a feeling that your friends or colleagues or other people are going to be understanding. I, at least for me personally, I found the anticipatory experience to be really isolating. Like I, I felt more self-conscious talking about it. I could find so little online. The resources were really not great that I could find. Um, and I even found the information from my vet to be really annoying. Actually, a lot of people have commented mm -hmm. on that article with the same thing. Like a, a lot of like, oh, you'll know when the time is right. Like they'll let you know. He'll let you know. I was like, what the, what, what does that yeah. even mean? What does that even yeah. mean? <laughs> right. And I think because we euthanize animals when mm. they are really sick and when we feel like the suffering becomes too much and, uh, you know, that that's such a normalized thing, there's this added weight, I think, that is there, which sometimes is present in other types of death with humans as well. Like when we're making decisions about withdrawal of support or uh, like ventilatory care and things like that. But yeah, there's just like a lot of layers to that and you yeah. can't communicate. They can't speak English. They can't speak, oh my gosh. they can't speak 
period. So I don't know. All of that for me was just like yeah. such a whirlwind in the anticipatory space. So I guess I say mm -hmm. like, I don't know, maybe framing that to start with, because I feel like before yeah. we even get to the death, there is like so much in the anticipatory space that I struggled to find support for. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a lot there that you just said. I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> now I definitely hear what you're, you're saying. Um, just even, you know, my dog has had some health issues lately. And just even with that, I, you're always asking yourself the question, like, are you in, are you in pain? I don't know. I can't tell like what, you know, there are signs, but it's not always as obvious as that. Oh, you'll know thing. Yes. And the fact that you have to often make that decision, I feel like is, is agonizing and excruciating because you don't want to make it you at the wrong time. You don't want to wait too long, but then nobody wants to cut it an animal's life short if they don't have to. Uh, and so I do feel like that's a very, very weighty decision. And if, if your vet's not clear cut telling you like, you know, it's time, then it is, it's really difficult. Like, how would you know, you know, especially like if you, maybe this is your first time going through this experience, you know, yep. I just feel like it's asking a lot of people to just know. I, I don't think they do just know. And they have to go based on the information that they're given by the vet, maybe cues from the animal, but maybe not. And then, like you yeah. said, turning to sort of the resources on the internet sometimes. And I, I feel like part of the issue with a lot of the grief support is the infrastructure just really isn't there to provide support from the vet not, not all vets, but from many vets on down, like I can remember standing at the counter, just checking my dog into board at a vet while I'm standing three feet away from a, the, the person at the vet on the phone with somebody telling them their dog died and didn't make it through a surgery. And it was just kind of like, you know, and they were sensitive about it, but it was, it was a little more matter of fact than how we treat other types of losses. And so I just, feel like maybe the systems are not in place and the infrastructure isn't there to give people support from the first step. And now that may not be true yeah. for every, every vet, every situation, but in many instances, I think that might be a contributing factor to why this is uniquely difficult many times. Yeah. And I, I think animals like, like humans at end of life, right, have, have good days and bad days. And so that, uh, that, oh, they'll let you know, um, was something that several people I know have commented on, on that article and in other conversations I've had with folks have been like, there'll be days and days where an animal has stopped eating and seems really disinterested and doesn't want to go for a walk. And then suddenly the next day they're up eating all their food, ready mm. to go out, you know? And so like, there's a lot of, mm. of mixed messages and inconsistency and, and it, and it feels really hard and complicated when that is happening. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, there are these other layers. Um, you know, Jennifer, who's tuning in live, just shared something that I also think is incredibly difficult about pets is that they are often connected to other significant things in our lives. Like maybe it is a person in your life who died, who you, it was their pet, or you bought that pet together. Or you got that, you know, you got the pet to take care of after they died as the, the caregiver. And then this pet is like a connection to mm -hmm. that person. And that is, I think over it, it's part of that anticipatory grief. It's part of the decision making. It's this added layer yeah. of like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to say goodbye to you, and I'm saying goodbye to this connection to the the person who I've already lost. Um, for me, I think one thing that was complicated was you know my dog who died a couple of years ago. I got with my ex. Mm. And so it did feel like one of the last things that kept our relationship together. Like, you know, we still shared this animal and both loved our dog so much. And, you know, so it did feel really weighted when we were saying goodbye to him because it did feel like it was symbolically something that 
connected our relationship as well. And so I think that is this huge added layer that's there. Sometimes it's that you got that animal as support. I remember after my dad died, my mom got a dog and like we used to joke about it a lot because my dad would never let us get a dog. My mom had always had a dog growing mm-hmm. up, but my dad was not a dog person, no interest in having a dog. So when my dad died, um, it was like, well, guess guess there can be a dog in the house. Um, so my mom got a dog and which was like wonderful. Like this dog was, I think, so great for my mom and just everybody. But when she died, even though she hadn't even known my dad because she was connected to my dad's death and the grief and that was like this comfort animal, there was still a feeling of like a connection to my dad and the loss. So I think there's like so many layers to the way animals weave in to symbolically being connected to eras Mm -hmm. of our lives, people in our lives. Yeah, for sure. I think that you know, these are all those reasons that are just so incredibly unique and personal. And so when, you know, thinking about after an animal dies and we often don't get quite the amount of maybe support or time, or maybe we ourselves don't feel we can carve that out for ourselves. Uh, A lot of times I think, you know, it kind of uh, when we say something like, oh, our dog died yesterday, we m- m- are met with minimized responses. And what saying my dog died doesn't quite encapsulate are all these many, 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 many things that that animal meant to us and all the many ways that we are now on a day-to-day basis grieving and experiencing that absence. Um, And I just don't think we think about that. Like as much as when we're talking about the death of a person, you know, it's different. Of course it's different, but it doesn't mean just because it's different doesn't mean that it isn't significant to us in so many, many ways. Yeah. I think the presence of an animal in our homes too is something that people don't really and always understand when things are being minimized. I mean, I think when you think about how much time we spend with our animals, when we think about the fact that our animals are often in the house with us all the time, we're so used to walking back into the house and having that animal be there every single time. Like it is, you know, when you live with other people, you know, maybe they're out doing something, maybe they're not. People come and and go from your household and, you know, all of your animal is there with you. Uh, all of the time. And I think that emptiness in the house is Mm -hmm. so, can feel so overwhelming, especially for people who maybe already live alone. And if your animal was your one companion in the house, uh, that emptiness can feel absolutely overwhelming. It's like a deafening silence, I think, in the house that, that people experience. And again, I think it just, for those who have been through that, I think we often feel it deeply. I think for other people, it may be hard to imagine or remember or connect to. Mm -hmm. Again, part of this too, like all grief, right? Our, Our grief is a reflection of the relationship we had with whatever was lost. And some people have lost animals and their connection and the kind of animal relationship they had with their pet might be different than the kind of relationship that you had with your pet. And so you, even with other people who have lost animals, sometimes it doesn't feel like they maybe fully understand or appreciate it if you had a different type of relationship with your pet than they did. Well, that's very true. I I think if you have an animal in the house and you are not that close to it, but maybe your partner like lets the cat sit on his lap for hours on end every night, it's going to be different for each of you. And then when you go out in the world, if you didn't have that close relationship, if you go out in the world and someone else says, oh, my, my cat died, um, you know, you're going to 
oftentimes, whether we like it or not, we overlay our own experiences on top of people. And if you think to yourself, well, I didn't have a very hard time with that. You know, it's hopefully we can see past that and offer people compassion for what they're bringing to us. But oftentimes that doesn't always happen. Um, and maybe, maybe it's not you who doesn't do that, but maybe it's the people in your life who don't do that. And so I can definitely see like, and even within different families, like we have a dog and she I think it means different things to every single person in our family. Like the minute my middle child walks through the door, she's like yelling for Pepper because Pepper comes to her and always like brings her like a sock or something, like whatever she can find close by. And like they have a little routine and like they're the closest. And I can tell that that's going to be for her someday a really, really, really difficult loss. It'll be difficult for everybody, but I just see how it's different for her. I My job is mostly to just kind of like feed <laughs> feed Pepper. And like I do a lot of that stuff. I don't do a lot of the affection and all that stuff. So I can see how it's going to be different someday and this is part of that anticipatory thing because I know it's going to happen, you know. Um, it, yeah, it's just different for everybody, even within that household, what that loss means. I absolutely agree and have certainly seen the same thing over the years in my family or different families and households with dogs. And I, I think, too, there's this added layer and, and someone else just mentioned this in the chat as well. When an animal, when the relationship you have with an animal is that you have leaned on that animal for support when going through other difficult things in life, whether it is a death or anything else difficult. I think when you leave on, lean on an animal for support, there is just like kind of this incredible like vulnerability and intimacy that we have with animals like we're not worried about their judgment we're not worried about anything we're often able to be you know fully sort of there with all our emotion you know i think about the study that just came out a couple of years ago when they did research with people who'd experienced traumatic bereavements of some sort and they looked at their social support and they did this really comprehensive survey asking questions about every relationship you can imagine, like your therapist, your priest, your accountant, like everybody and how they provided grief support, friends, family. But, and the one and only thing that surfaced from that study by leaps and bounds across the board of like who provides the best grief support was pets. It was the yeah. thing that like statistically was so far beyond any other type of relationship in the study. And I think that we just receive this incredible love and support from pets and it allows us to be able to show ourselves so openly and authentically with our pets in ways that we often can't mm -hmm. with even people we feel really close to. I, so I think that the layer the, of losing that when an animal has been a support is immense. I mean, I will never forget all that time that we had spoken at a conference and that woman chased us out to the parking lot. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and she was so sort of overwhelmed with this guilt that she was feeling because she had experienced multiple previous losses, uh, significant. She had had a child die and, um, she, and had also lost a partner and her dog had recently died and she was feeling so overwhelmed by the grief of her dog's death in this way that like she, almost felt guilty about how she felt like she was feeling it more intensely than other losses that she had been through. But clearly a huge part of it was that, that her, her dog had been such a huge support to her in the past. And now she was feeling incredibly alone. You know, there were all these other things that you could see were going on yeah. there, but I, I think it was complicated almost for her feeling like the intensity of her grief so far surpassed what she expected because she was comparing it to other human losses and maybe had internalized some of those feelings of like, well, I shouldn't be feeling so much grief for my animal. But of course, right. like, of course she was. It, there were all these layers 
and the loss of an animal is enormous on its own. Yeah, I and I don't think that's the only time we've heard that. I feel like we've heard that many times since. And when people say that, I never take it to mean I cared less about this person than, than <gasps> this animal. I only take it to mean that this was, like you said, like this was a my pet uh, I had a relationship with that, you know, was supportive and it was always there. It was a constant and I'm having a really hard time with the fact that I now don't have them. I mean, maybe sometimes people are closer with their animals than certain people in their lives. That is true too sometimes. Uh, oh, yeah. And so we cannot underestimate the closeness that people feel, the relationship that people have with their animals. Oftentimes they feel very much like relationships with other people and that's that's totally understandable. So yeah, I think oftentimes it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, but yeah. when we start comparing, that's when we start feeling guilty. And that's the thing is like having grief for a pet that feels a certain way does not mean anything about how we feel for people who have died and our grief for people who have died. Like one does not take away from the other. And this is uniquely difficult for a, a whole host of reasons that maybe yeah. that wasn't, you know, and, and, and vice versa. Uh, so it's okay for this to feel really, really hard. That doesn't mean that you're minimizing the, the severity or the trauma or, or anything when it comes to the death of a person that you love very dearly. Um, it yeah. just is what it is. It just is what it is. Well, and I think that the, you know, there's all these other pieces too, when there has been a, a death of a person, especially when they happen fairly close together, which I think we hear this not uncommonly situations where someone has a, a someone in their life die who it's a very significant loss and their animal is maybe their primary support, only person that they live with, you know, is really the... Thing that is helping them in their grief to get out of bed in the morning and to have some, you know, another being to feed and be responsible for and take care of. And I think sometimes we underestimate in grief how important that is that, like, having that reason to get out of bed in the morning, having that animal that you feel not just the companionship with, but a sense of responsibility for, can really be a uh, a grounding force in grief. And mm -hmm. when that animal dies um, and you're, you know, really still in the acute grief place, even if you're not in the acute grief place, it's a huge, it, it's a huge shock to lose that grounding force. And I think it can mm -hmm. make it so that we, it, it's, it's almost easier for us to not take care of ourselves when we're not taking care of our animals because sometimes our mm -hmm. animal is yeah. helping to create that routine and schedule and like the thing that was, you know, getting us to maybe take a walk during the day or get up at a particular time, even on the weekends and not just, you know, sort of feel like we were trapped in bed in the way that grief can can do. And yeah. so I think that can be another real significant thing when we lose an animal and we're already in a in a hard place. And maybe that's not a hard place with, through a death. It maybe is just it's depression or it's yeah. other just difficult moments in life. Losing that grounding force of taking care of another being that we love is really significant to just how how we're doing in the world. Yeah. So obviously we've kind of expressed that this gets minimized, um, that perhaps for many people they don't feel like there's a supportive you know, network or the infrastructure just isn't there for receiving support at, at various points. We have seen the needle move on this though. I do yeah. think that there's more acknowledgement for the significance of pet loss. And though I don't know that you're gonna find good support everywhere, I do think that there are some more niche spaces that are cropping up that really provide sp support specifically for this type of loss. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that there definitely are. You see more groups for it, both online, in-person groups. I think you see acknowledgement. I also think you see more stories like people sharing their mm -hmm. pet loss stories and their relationship with their animals you know i i think one thing 
that also strikes me about why it's so complicated grieving an animal and can be so hard. It's like only you or only you and your family kind of knew your pet really well. Like when you have a, a, you know, a person in your life, they had their coworkers or friends or, you know, extended people. Like there were those connections and with pets, oftentimes we don't have, there's not that like collective grief that can happen and, you know, as much or as easily. And in the last few years, I've heard more and more just like narratives um, and read people's essays about their Mm -hmm. relationships with their animals. And it's a great podcast episode I'll link to from Rumble Strip called More Than a Dog that is sort of about about this. And there are just, there's so many of those I've seen in recent years. And I don't know, maybe I'm just more tuned into it, but I do think that there are more spaces where people do like connecting to and seeing really thoughtful things that try to capture those unique relationships that we have with our animals, because they often are so personal. Like they happen inside of our homes very privately and So I think like there's looking for spaces like support groups and things Mm -hmm. like that. But sometimes there's also real comfort in, I don't know, other people just like getting that validation of like, right, we have these really incredible intimate relationships with our pets. Like we have that and reading other people's experiences Mm -hmm. or listening to them, I think can be really comforting. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think that, you know, if it's not a support group or something like that, there's also just better, not again, not everywhere, but there's better support in terms of sometimes the stuff you can find like online, like you, you, you talked about not finding a lot of what you wanted, but I do know that the grief healing blog has some good stuff dedicated to pet loss. And I think I see it come up a lot more on Instagram supportive spaces. So I do think that, you know, just kind of maybe it's something that you connect with every once in a while uh, when you feel like you need it. Then I also just think thinking about a lot of the same coping tools that we talk about all the time, things like having a little ritual, taking the time for your animal to have a memorial, you know, the same things that you often think about with any type of loss, many of those things are relevant here, you know, having a little marker, maybe where they're buried, doing a ritual after a year, if that's something, if that time of year is feeling really hard, just like, don't don't dismiss it and write it off if it's something that you're feeling. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and I think to like know that that can continue for a long time. Again, another space. I, I'll clarify what I felt was there not, was not a lot of anticipatory grief support for pet loss. So I, I do think there's lots of post death support. But one of the other things I I felt like too is just longer term. It it feels a little more strange. Like in society, we've mm-hmm. normalized you know, that you're, that hopefully we're normalizing more, right? Talking about people long after they're gone. But sometimes I feel like with pets, like we hesitate a little bit, maybe in that first year, like, okay, my Mm -hmm. dad, my dog died this year or last year. But I think as time goes on, people feel more and more self-conscious talking about their animals that died a long time ago. Um, But I think just normalizing that too, like if that feels good to you, tell, tell stories about your animals. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. Like they still have, like they still leave this imprint on us. And so I think leaning into that can be really important. Yeah. Have, have the pictures out, you know, have that stuff. I think, uh, tell, like you said, tell the stories. Like I know, like I said, I know all the dogs my husband ever (laughs) had in his family. And you know, who talks about him where his mom talks about them all the time. She talks about how they're all different, you know, all their different personalities and things like that. And they always, you know, they'll wait a couple years and then they'll get another golden retriever. So they've had, they have one right now who's gigantic, young, Mm -hmm. crazy, but yeah, they, they remember them all very uniquely. And I yeah. like to know those things. Um, so, agree. Yeah. well, you know, if anybody else has suggestions or anything like that, um, please share and um, we'll always add it to our 
list of recommended resources that we share with people who do reach out to us looking for stuff about pet loss. Cause like you said, we have a couple articles, you're working on a new article. Yes. Uh, we're a general, <laughs> we're a more general website, right? So a lot of our stuff I think does apply to this experience, even though it might not be labeled pet loss. Um, but I do think some of those niche spaces can be really helpful. So if people know about any that they recommend, please do share with us. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that wraps things up for us today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you.